All right. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to Drupal is Not Your Website. Uh, I'm going to be giving a talk about developing Drupal for high scale fragmented websites. Uh, when I was putting together this presentation, I was trying to come up with a really cool, clever hashtag uh, for this, or everybody could tweet about it, but I couldn't come up with anything. The, uh, the initials are B-I-N-Y-W-S, which at best that pronounces uh, out as, as Vanillas, and then that turned into like a Princess Bride Game of Thrones crossover, and that's, that really needs to be another box. So. Uh, just a couple of pr uh, presumptions and expectations. Um, to give you an idea of what to expect during the session, uh, this is technically an intermediate DevOps uh, session, so I expect you to kind of be at least experienced with site building in Drupal and some basic DevOps concepts. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean anybody has to be well versed in it, but, uh, but it's a good idea to have some passing familiarity. Um, I'll give you an overview of some concepts. Uh, I'll introduce you to maybe some new concepts or, or apply new names to old concepts. Um, and, and then hopefully be able to give you some suggested modules and uh, resources that you can use for your own implementations. So uh, today I'll try to cover what a website really is. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about the edge, the origin, um, the client side. Uh, these are different locations um, that content can, can come from. Uh, and, and I'll go about in, in, in quite a bit of detail about those. Uh, how does Drupal fit into your overall stack? If Drupal's not your website, what is? Um, some other elements of, of a website to consider outside of Drupal. Um, we'll talk about removing things from Drupal, offloading things uh, for other services for overall performance. Uh, and then finally, some real-time and custom content updates on your website. So just to start off uh, with a brief analogy. Uh, does anybody, show of hands, or you can just blurt it out, I don't care, uh, does anybody know the origin of the Mississippi? <coughs> Lake Ithaca? Uh, that's it? Yeah. Close. Uh, so technically the origin of the Mississippi is, is Harper's Ferry in Iowa. Uh, but it's a little confusing because at this point it's already a pretty, pretty, pretty wide river. It's already a pretty active river. Uh, technically, it does begin in Harper's Ferry, Iowa, uh, but even even before that, um, runoff and lakes and streams and rivers and other tributaries, uh, all the way up into Canada, even, uh, have contributed to the Mississippi to give it a good start. Um, at this point, it's already a mighty river. In fact, the name Mississippi uh, actually means uh, mighty river, uh, so it's the mighty, mighty river. Uh, but it's the ATM machine of rivers. Um, but, but it's important to, to note that even though it's already a mighty river at the beginning, at its origin, uh, that, that it, is, it does become something even more powerful uh, than, than the origin uh, gives it. So this, this official starting point we refer to often as the origin. Uh, and so you know, then we talk about content inclusion uh, from the origin uh, the waters at, at the origin of the Mississippi are virtually the same as what flows out um, into, the, into the Gulf of Mexico as its output. But more waters contribute along the way. You have the Colorado River, the Arkansas River, which is the best river. Um, you have, yeah, Arkansas River Bex fan, so um, I've got to get that dig in. So, you know, other rivers and, and tributaries contribute along the way, changing the volume, the flow, the ebb the overall composition of the very waters themselves of the mighty Mississippi. So how does the mighty Mississippi have to do with your website? So let's take a step back just a moment to define what a website truly is. In a very technical sense, a user makes, through his browser or her browser, an HTTP request to a web server. The web server parses the request, hands it off to other special handlers, maybe PHP or even Drupal. The web server sends back an HTML document uh, or other content, uh, it doesn't have to be HTML, and the browser parses the, the response for rendering. So the browser executes JavaScript that it finds and any other content that it's instructed to add. So going back to the very beginning, this is the uh, official CERN website. Uh, when, when the web was launched, it was the very first website. Recently, as of about a year and a half ago, uh, 
uncovered in some sort of social archaeology. Um, and I, I can't imagine uh, the uh, number of doors worn while excavating this website. But, uh, it, it was just a simple collection of, of hypertext documents uh, that could be requested one at a time from a web server. Uh, there was no CMS. Uh, files were files were edited directly on the server using Emacs. Um, this was Mr. CERN's website. Um, nothing else was added to it, so the, the HTML document that was served from the website is actually what the, uh, the end user received. And so just as a, an interesting sidebar, let me bring this up. And the very first website in existence was responsible. <laughs> CERN was really looking ahead. <laughs> so, so editing files on a server directly through Emacs, um, or if you want to be easy on yourself through Vi, or you know, honestly, let's face it, Nano. Uh, that's sort of text editing anymore. Um, up here, I'm not careful. So uh, that's that's all well and good for the first website, but uh, you want to make changes. You want revisions. You want you want all the other things uh, that, that 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 offers. The site grows over time, and it's kind of unmanageable to add a text file. So uh, there became, over the course of history, lots of different ways to assemble pages. So I'm going to talk a few about, about a few of these. Um, Server side includes uh, was a great step um, in, in in the way of organizing your content. Uh, CGI, uh, like Perl, uh, scripting languages like PHP, um, you know, gave way uh, to the advent of CMSs, uh, such as Drupal. Um, there's other things though that can that can help build your page, and that's you know, edge side includes client side assembly. Um, you know, in, in, in fact, uh, Drupal mentioned a, a lot about um, the importance of uh, Drupal 8 in the future, uh, allowing for big pipe, for instance. Um, in fact, nothing new. Um, Facebook thinks they invented something cool, but it's, it's been around for actually a very long time. Uh, just got a cool thing. So uh, to start off with, uh, show of hands, I'm just kind of curious who uh, who was around back in the day when SSI was the, the biggest way to, yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a great content management system, a bunch of text files on a server that you edit, and uh, you, you make the change once and they appear everywhere. It's great. Um, Server side includes, for those that don't know, uh, but the concept is simple. You have what looks like HTML tags uh, with, with a bang in there uh, to, in, to indicate that, or hash tag, I guess, to indicate that this is an include or it's some sort of if conditional. Uh, and, you know, it just kind of, it, you know, it used to be a very common practice. It's now very infrequently used. Uh, but in short, it lets you take fragments of pages, uh, include them into HTML pages, plus and uh, you know to, to build the whole page. So conceptually, it's, it's actually still a very common practice. So employing server side includes pages might look something like this. Uh, even though the technology behind it is somewhat outmoded and, and not really used in practice anymore, the pattern should actually be very familiar to most people. Uh, the Drupal region block template system is really fundamentally no different than server side includes. You've got the overall HTML page, page template file. Um, you have your region template file, maybe. You have block template files, and, and so on. It's just a little bit more advanced implementation of SSI in a lot of ways. I'm kind of approaching that. But, um, so after a request is made, for instance, uh, Drupal takes that request, builds a response page by going through the bootstrap process, and returns a full HTML document. In this particular instance, uh, Drupal is what we would refer to as the origin, uh, just like Harper's Ferry back in Iowa. So, as far as the web browser is concerned, the HTML could have been dynamically generated on the fly. Uh, it could be served from a flat HTML file. It could be served uh, out of memory cache. It doesn't really matter. Uh, in the end, uh, in the end, what the web browser displays, uh, it, it just doesn't matter. So 
What's more is, is what's delivered to the user's browser may be further changed by client-side activities, uh, like Ajax calls, adding for more, more content. Uh, JavaScript can show a high content uh, on the page. Uh, there's also client-side assembly for JavaScript and, and web sockets can uh, work together to pull in additional customized page fragments. This is kind of what's referred to as, as big type of work. So then, what really is the distinction? Why is Drupal not your website? So in a, in a typical uh, in a typical Drupal implementation, let's take a look. So nodes contain articles, blogs, etc. Uh, blocks can, can provide uh, additional content on the same page. Uh, panels uh, arranges content on the page, um, and, and this is this is kind of what we refer to as a typical Drupal website. You know, we can kind of call it the Drupal website, uh, even though the thing that users are interacting with, uh, which is the website, is not all, always directly uh, Drupal. So that starts to sound like, well, is, is Drupal really my website? Uh, so just to, just to make everything absolutely clear, so Drupal sends an HTML document, the browser receives the same HTML. That doesn't mean that something in the middle can't potentially change it, right? So if nothing changes at post-render, then it seems like Drupal's page is your website. So in this, uh, in, a, in, in the uh, mathematical equation that I use to prove my, my, my theorem, uh, or whatever, uh, what happens if, if X never changes? Drupal, for all intents and purposes, is your website. Um, if, if X never changes, the equation seems like a constant, right? So what happens to the equation when the variable changes? For starters, let's take a look at some of the different variables that might actually affect your website. Uh, performance and scale are some big variables that frequently change what Drupal generates, and the final HTML document that the end user sees. Every method of page assembly has its costs. Because of this, you kind of have to think about how we want to architect the overall page or the overall website or a section of your website or, or whatever, uh, in which the end user interacts in order to make it as efficient as possible to serve and build and to maintain. Sometimes that means breaking things apart into components, which I'll talk about fragmentation uh, momentarily. But uh, you know, every every single thing seems to have uh, a payoff with, with resource cost, and and resource contention is always a, a problem when you're dealing with limited servers and things like that. So. PHP execution is costly. Uh, it's just, it's just kind of the simple, you know. Until we have PHP seven, you know, which uh, gets, gets really close to machine code, it's going to be, it's going to be kind of costly to parse and and uh, turn PHP into something executable. Um, and not, not to mention, Drupal has a lot of PHP files and you know millions of lines of code. So it does combat some of these performance issues with caching and, and other methods. So this slide here is a profile of the bootstrap process. Uh, single page load, it's this, this is taken directly from Drupal.org. I know this slide is, is very hard to read, uh, but the, the, the complexity should be pretty obvious. Of, you know, this, there's a lot going on under the hood for just a single page load in Drupal. So when we talk about scaling Drupal, there's actually several things that we do just kind of commonly uh, out of, out of habit, if nothing else. So we might uh, uh, put multiple web servers behind a single load balancer. Uh, we use cache layers like Varnish. Um, you can use Memcache or Redis uh, for a lot of the internal caches. Uh, all of these things sort of act like defensive linemen uh, or bodyguards that kind of stand between an aggressive flood of users to protect the limited resources of the origin server. So here's, here's just a diagram of a, of a very simple uh, enterprise level stack, or it's not even enterprise level. But, uh, the final HTML document that you see there, that's the thing that's passed off to the, to the end user. The browser renders that. It might do some things to it later on, later down the road. Uh, but in this, in this particular case, that, uh, that final HTML document is actually coming from Varnish or from a CDN. Uh, that Varnish or that CDN originally pulled that from the load balancer, you know, going back to its origin uh, to get the original piece of content. Uh, but then Varnish, Varnish attached to it. It, it just it says, hey, I recognize that request. 
This is what I got back last time I, uh, I rendered that page, uh, and I'm just going to give it back. It's a whole lot faster, and it protects resources on the server. Uh, so, so varnish, varnish caches is, is, is really the, typically the thing your users are interacting with, uh, not Drupal, uh, varnish in this case. Um, yeah, so, so the, the, really the request only goes to Drupal if the cache is invalid, out of date, or just simply not present. Uh, so in this case, uh, the load balancer picks a webhead, Nginx called phpftm, or Apache spawns a PHP thread uh, through, you know, hot CGI or whatever, however the setup is, and then Drupal renders the appropriate page. So in this case, Drupal is really the bad thing, and this is to distinguish between back-end development and front-end development. This is, this is truly back-end of, of your DevOps stack. So, and, and, and I say that it's, it's the back end because uh, Drupal is not always the, 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 the last thing that affects or modifies the page. Um, it, it, it is important to note that uh, you know, in, in the case of a varnish configuration or CDNs, um, you know, a lot of these requests can't be modified by Drupal because Drupal never actually <coughs> receives the response or the, uh, the, the HTTP. So I kind of alluded to fragmentation as a way to sort of offload some of the performance of your Drupal CMS. Um, and, and, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about fragmentation. So Drupal does a lot of things, right? It's a, it's a content management system. It's a, it's a content management framework. Uh, Drupal manages users. It manages your primary content. It even manages your, the look and feel of your site. But it doesn't need to do everything for your website, nor should it. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to assemble fragments, and, and I'll go into some of these in detail. Um, but but the, this here is, is sort of the, the, the two uh, two most common methods of post Drupal render uh, with fragmented page assembly. You've got client side, uh, where JavaScript is, is executing from the browser to go fetch additional content or change or manipulate the content on the page. Uh, versus something like Varnish and CDN, which uses Edge side includes to assemble things on the edge. Now, I, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the edge. I don't really have a good illustration for this, but if you think about the origin of the server, the sort of the core of, of your content, the edge is out here somewhere, uh, literally on the edge, um, as, as sort of the last thing uh, your content passes through on its way to the user before it leaves the, the, the stack. A lot of times this is Varnish, or a CDN such as CloudFront and Aquaman. <coughs> So there's a lot of content that might not actually originate at Drupal at all, uh, in fact, um, other than just a simple reference to it at the presentation layer. Um, it, it, it's actually very common to integrate third-party content on the client side. Uh, in, in some cases, you might have a news website where you have breaking news. Uh, a reporter might be able to actually talk to a breaking news interface through his cell phone. Um, and all that is is just a text file sitting somewhere. Uh, they, they get pulled in uh, either by Varnish or CDN uh, to, to insert that into the top of the page. Um, another another story I like to tell is if for those of you that you know that, that may remember several years back, um, you know, the White House uh, we launched on Drupal six, and then sometime later um, the, the the We the People the petitions website was was built. And that was built on Drupal 7, and these were actually disparate sites. And uh, an interesting thing about that is if you were logged in, let's say, let's say you logged into the petitions website, and you go to whitehouse.gov, there was a little bar that kind of followed you around the site. You didn't see that if you were logged in. Now, ironically, the actual web page that you were visiting, uh, for all intents and purposes, as far as Drupal was concerned, uh, was, an, was an anonymous page. It wasn't an authenticated page. Uh, the interesting thing is there was a tiny little uh, edge site include reference at the very bottom of the, of the HTML that would include other content fragments from this Drupal 7 site, the, the Widget Drupal site. And so what, what's neat about that is Akamai front-ended the White House. It would serve these anonymous pages that had absolutely no custom content whatsoever. And then if you were logged in, uh, you might see that little blue bar following you around from page to page. Uh, using edge site includes, it would look, it would use uh, ESI conditionals to look at your session cookie. 
if you had a valid session cookie, what it would do is make a request to a Drupal 7 callback, uh, some other, you know, a menu hook registers a callback, the callback pulls up that, that session uh, out of your cookie, and it says, welcome Toby, and links to your profile page. So interestingly enough, uh, those ESI fragments could also be further uh, cached by Aqua. And so what's happening is you're building a completely custom page for the end user using nothing but cached anonymous pages straight out of uh, Akamai memory. So that's kind of an illustration of, of how you can really gain a lot of performance by using XSite includes to build things actually at the edge. So the content assembly is not actually done. You know, Drupal, Drupal's done its thing, it's just a page out, and it's not complete. It's pulling in fragments from other websites, uh, from other sources, and assembles these things on the edge, and then delivers the fully form HTML document on to the user. Uh, this is this is actually pretty common with a lot of other things too. If you think about it, uh, user comments, for for instance, is a, is a great example. Uh, Facebook, uh, uh, Facebook Social, uh, Discuss. There's a, there's a few others. Uh, you know, every every website now likes to have the Twitter block. Um, in, the, in the right rail of their site. Um, another great example is uh, real-time scores, uh, standings if, you're, if you go to a lot of sports websites. Uh, breaking news alerts. Uh, but if you think about it, analytics and advertising, these are all things that are part of your site's content that are assembled after they leave board. So just a couple of examples of externally posted comments. Uh, you actually have quite a bit of control over how they look up here. Um, Drupal comments uh, require that the user is authenticated. Uh, being able to offload comments to using a third-party system means that uh, authenticated users aren't hitting your website every time. And that's, that's kind of cost on performance, right? So if you can offload that to some other service, you don't have to worry about it anymore. You can serve anonymous content every single time, but still get a lot of the user, action, uh, user interaction that you do with, with commenting systems. So Drupal might print the placeholder on the page for comments, but it's not actually aware of any of the content contained in the final web page. So this is part of your website, but not part of Drupal. So uh, I've, I've talked a little bit about the uh, uh, client-side assembly. Uh, and in fact, Dries mentioned this in his keynote uh, yesterday morning when he talked about big type and some things that, you know, is exciting and new about uh, Drupal 8. Uh, a lot of folks have been, have been talking about headless Drupal and some of the some of the benefits that, that offers, uh, but quite honestly, you could do that now, um, you know, even without this really. So, uh, you know, it does go by a lot of different names depending on how much the page architecture, you know, relies on on, on this strategy. Um, some people refer to this as single page applications. Some people call it big pipe. Um, you know, just depending on how much of the of the page is actually a simple client side. So a couple of neat things that you can do to assemble a page client side. Um, when you want to talk about implementing real-time updates, and, and by real-time I don't mean every second a piece of JavaScript is pulled on some server. That's not real-time. It's, it's close, but you have a delay of one second. You know, it's, that's, that's, kinda, that's kind of okay in a lot of circumstances, but if you're watching, uh, you know, if you're watching sport, you want to see that, that you want to see the score update in real-time. So uh, a thing that was introduced in HTML5, this is several years old now, but uh, the WebSocket specification. And uh, there's, a, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of tools and frameworks that actually implement uh, good versions of WebSockets. But essentially what a WebSocket is, for those who don't know, is an HTTP request gets opened. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, just a socket. Uh, it gets opened to a server. And in normal cases, you think of your web page, it makes the request, the server hands the response back and closes the connection immediately. In this case, what happens is the, the response actually stays open. So, so your browser is talking to some Node.js-based scoring system constantly. And it's just a, it's just a type that stays open. And it uses virtually no bandwidth other than it occasionally may change to make sure that that, that connection is still open. But you can have something like half a million users connected through WebSockets um, and have virtually no resources going on at all. Then what happens is, um, I don't know, the, the Clipper score, and somebody increments the score in this Node.js service, and that pushes out to all half a million of your connected users.
computer simultaneously the updated score. <laughs> that gets picked up through a JavaScript event and immediately changes the page. It's also very nice for those that do uh, news websites, you know, especially on election nights, you're not having to constantly pull some service because if you're constantly making a request, get nothing back, and closing that request, you still have a lot of HTTP overhead. And uh, hopefully somebody can help me out. Uh, I forget the quote, I forget the author. But essentially the, the, the fastest HTTP request is the one never made. So WebSockets allows you to not make more requests for uh, real-time content. So uh, in the past, I've worked on a lot of support sites. Um, so live scoring is always a business rule that comes up. It's very difficult to work with in the confines of Drupal. You know, real time is essential, and, and I joke that that you know one second is not real time. You know, that a, a one second poll is not real time, but it's, it's legit. That's a that's a that's a big concern between real time and one second. Sometimes. So HTTP connection is costly, like I said. Um, you know, and uh, you know this 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 applies to lots of other edge cases. So WebSockets. Uh, a very common framework is Socket.io. Uh, this is just a little piece of JavaScript to show you. Uh, Drupal may have a block that contains a piece of JavaScript that looks like this. There's nothing in here that Drupal knows anything about, uh, other than it just it says the print this to the, uh, to the web browser. The web browser executes this JavaScript. It makes a connection to a socket somewhere, and, and that takes over from there. Drupal never actually knows what's going on here in terms of content. So I'm talking a lot about live scoring because that's such a, an obvious uh, edge case. Um, you know, so this, this is one more thing that you can offload to another server. We have an API that exposes the scores via JSON. Uh, we offload the fetch and the display of the scores to the client side. That never has to get rendered in Drupal and never gets rendered in the page and never actually even gets uh, rendered to the point where that's in Varnish cache. The worst thing you can do on a sports website, by the way, is cache any page that has scores while the game's going on. <laughs> you have some frustrated users, let me tell you. Um, so this lets the browser keep the user up to date. It completely offloads um, all the owner's work where it actually belongs, which we're going to talk about. So I did talk a little bit about edge side includes, and I, I want to come back around to that. Um, so ESI is very similar. Um, the cache layer uh, parses the content and assembles the full page based on the content of the, the referenced uh, fragments. And ESI fragments are a very key feature of, of being able to make a, a performant uh, website um, where the origin is Drupal. Uh, so Drupal can actually generate these fragments for you. So Drupal can generate the anonymous, the unauthenticated page that gets stored in cache. Uh, and then all that Drupal really has to handle for authenticated users is generating these fragments. So just like we do with other pages uh, or other pieces of content, whether that's HTML, whether it's JSON output, if it's CSV exports, uh, these, these paths can all be cached by Varnish, by the way. Uh, you can also make references to external uh, sites and external services as well. So external ESI means that you have you can actually have users managed in a completely different space. Uh, this means you can actually have multiple uh, Drupal installs managing your one complex website. So we talked a little bit about authenticated versus unauthenticated users. That's that's important. Uh, you know, authenticated traffic bypasses a lot of the caching layer that we've built up to protect all the resources that we have on the server. So you can use ESI to provide a lot of customized service in an otherwise unauthenticated cache page. Um, you know, an, un 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 unauthenticated page, if it's on the poster right after lunch, is, is heavily cached. Um, you know, ESI lets you, uh, you know, customize, you know, all the things that, that users are, are accustomed to seeing. You know, the, the welcome username, here's a list of all your blog posts, all of these individual fragments on the page can now be cached for that specific user. No one else ever sees it. The nice thing is, if you're ever concerned, uh, by the way, about the security of that, um, because any action, um, such as creating content, editing content, removing, etc., would still have to go to origin. 
it would still have to talk to the group board, it would still have to authenticate again. Uh, so just because somebody somehow manages to get a, a patch page that says, well, I'm Toby and you're not Toby, uh, it, you know, they click on that, on that link and it's, it's not going to give them access to anything because this is just HTML. It's not actually interacting with group board. So here's, here's how that, that might actually look. Uh, you know, you can substitute Varnish for Akamai, for CloudFront, uh, any number of, of CDNs um, in order to manage the edge side. And in fact, ESI has a standard that was put together by over a dozen uh, different CDNs, uh, but Varnish does have a basic implementation of it, um, and so it's very, very useful. So, you know, in this particular case, Google received the request by Varnish by an unauthenticated user. Um, and captured that page in Varnish. Uh, everybody gets a copy of that page, no matter who you are. Uh, then Drupal also uh, gets a request uh, at a specific callback path for a fragment that says, welcome username, and, and Varnish assembles this page and delivers the HTML document. So I just wanted to kind of end with uh, a couple of different um, modules and resources uh, that, that might be valuable. The, the, the CDN project is is great. It handles a whole lot of uh, moving of content to, uh, to uh, CDMs. Uh, the ESI project uh, is a thing that lets you basically say, I want this particular block to be served as, as an edge site include. Uh, it also handles the callback for generating that fragment for you. Uh, Socket.io, that's, that's, that's the name of the framework, <coughs> and the web address. And then just the ESI specs in general. Um, there's, you know, the, the Varnish Cache uh, website has some great documentation on their version of, of ESI. Um, Akamai has a great, um, full, very robust implementation of it. I feel like I, I kind of rushed through things a little bit. Um, so at this time, I'd like to go ahead and open up the questions. Uh, if anybody uh, has any questions, uh, and we would talk implementation strategies. There's going to be a kind of Kind of technical if you want, or if you want me to kind of go over a particular thing, let me know. And I think probably the, the best thing to do is if you, uh, yeah, uh, there's no microphone in the middle there. Yeah, I'm using the microphone that I think it's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. I'll turn the top really loud. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about replace, talking about doing big type, you know, Facebook style. Has there been any real talks of how to actually implement that, or is it kind of a, something where you want to do? Okay, so the question is, uh, a lot of talk with Drupal 8, um, and, and maybe, you know, some, some, some of headless Drupal, and, and how to implement big type with Drupal Z, is pretty much the question. So, so there's a lot of ways to do it. So one of the things in, in, in Drupal 8, um, obviously, that everybody's excited about is, is headless Drupal, being able to kind of decouple the presentation from uh, the content management framework entirely. Um, one way that you might go about this is is using something like route subscriptions or the router system in Drupal 8. Uh, you can actually register a service uh, through, you know, this is sort of the, the Symphony service. You can register a service to handle uh, building a lot of the different components that get included on the page. So what you have is essentially, uh, I don't know, let's talk about like a user page, for instance. Uh, you go to your user page and it has a lot of placeholders in the user template file, in that twig file, uh, with a lot of JavaScript that goes and makes references to all of these other fragments. So the interesting thing is, is you can actually be looking at a page that's not generated by Drupal at all. Uh, it's just a, a piece of HTML, um, like a static HTML file, for instance, uh, or something that's generated by a Node.js service uh, that has JavaScript references to Drupal. And so your event subscriptions, for instance, uh, or your, I'm sorry, your route subscriptions could actually have a callback that says, all right, this user is authenticated. Here's a list of his last five blog posts. Here's uh, some profile information. Here's a list of people that he follows. Here's a list of people that follow him. And, and build that sort of page on the fly. You could uh, probably allow people to customize that in, in what tiles get, get pulled down. So that, that, that's sort of, that's sort of a, a very top level approach of how you would go ahead and uh, implement big pipe. Um, there's there's also some JavaScript frameworks that are coming out. Uh, I think Facebook is releasing one um, that's kind of related to how Facebook is handling big pipe. 
Um, so just like years ago when uh, CSS frameworks started coming out to help handle you know, grid systems, there's going to be a lot of competing uh, frameworks for, for big type as well. Any other questions? Where, where Akamai and, and Varnish are playing with DSI? Yep. Yeah, so, um, so uh, they, they, they play with DSI very much. Uh, so in, in you know, the case of the White House I gave you earlier, um, you know, Akamai front ends the entire collection of, of websites. Uh, and in this case, um, you know, you, you visit a page, you're not logged in, um, and, and you get to the page. So there's, there's actually DSI fragments contained in that page. And so um, the page that gets sent, uh, that you never actually see, the page that gets sent that goes through Akamai, Akamai processes that page. It sees the ESI fragments in there. Uh, there's some conditionals, you know, based on, hey, does this person have a session cookie? What's the value of that session cookie? And then it makes an, uh, a request to a different Drupal site, uh, like, like the Leave the People site. Um, and that request is very specific to your session. Uh, so it'll be something like uh, slash ESI slash user slash the session number or something to that effect, right? So it's a very unique path. Uh, that unique path can then be cached, so that fragment is cached. But the, the, the output of that path, um, the, the output of that callback that Drupal generates uh, is just a welcome user and a link to the profile and maybe a list of like the last, you know, five petitions you saw. And so... Uh, what what Akamai does in this particular case is it has uh, an ESI conditional that says, do so we have a, a valid session cookie? If yes, go and make a request of that fragment. Um, if it already has that fragment in its own cache, then it just loads it out of cache. Uh, if it doesn't, it can go back to Drupal to the origin and, and generates it and then inserts that all kind of place. So if you're assembling this page out on the edge, uh, Drupal doesn't actually the Drupal 6 site doesn't know that you're logged in to this Drupal 7 site over here. Does, does that make sense? Okay. And we, we can all talk later. Yeah, so, I have a follow up question on that. So, are you saying that then the session cookie becomes part of the cache key at the end? Like if the content is cached with a URL and the session cookie? Yeah. So, so, yeah, so the question is does, does the session cookie have a, a role in, in that? In that fact. Yeah, so so the the value of the session cookie is just you know, it's just a hash that sort of represents your session, and it's not even actually the session uh, value per se. Uh, but the, yeah, that that request um, is actually part of the, the session value, uh, the, the session cookie value. So what happens is uh, you you'll, you'll have it'll be just a, a sort of generic uh, callback that handles that particular session that looks it up in a in a special table. And it's not actually the Drupal session. Uh, what's going on is they've actually got a, a custom uh, uh, hash value, you know, that corresponds to a particular user, just so that there's not, you know, it reduces the chance of session hijacking. Uh, but what happens is it, it's got this session value. It looks it up, and then it does a couple of things like, is this user actually authenticated? Are they an active account, et cetera, et cetera? Does that go back to Drupal? Yeah, it goes back, to, but it goes back to the the people website and not the actual live White House site. So, um, Akamai is front ending the the Drupal well, stuff now, but the, the, it, it front ends the, the White House site, uh, and then goes and pulls, making a request to this other with the people site over here for that little fragment to insert. So, so that fragment is not actually cached. The fragment is not <laughs> So, so interestingly enough, it's it's not cached the first time, but after the request is made, because it's such a unique ID, um, you know, and, and it's you know, it is tied to a, a user, and that, that that token gets destroyed when the user logs out. Um, the results of that ESI fragment uh, request are actually cached. So what happens is Akamai now says, okay, the next time you go to another page, it says, okay, I've got the next page already in cache. Let me deliver that. And I need to assemble some other thing. And so it pulls those fragments that it's already generated out of its own cache. So you're, you're only making a run for a And you said that session, that, that cookie is destroyed. It's not logged in. So that's roughly 10 Yeah. It, 
it's just like with any other session handling in, in Drupal. But it was it was a way to kind of uniquify that path, um, since most varnish and CDN caching is based on that. Instances of running um, uh, little Acquia servers in a shared environment so we can use multiple Docker's. And we're using Varnish through SSL, but we also have a combination in one instance of some SSL sites or sites using SSL um, and sites that aren't on the same server. Um, we haven't been able to really find any clear documentation in terms of. If memcache is an issue in that kind of a situation in terms of caching information, we wouldn't want to have cache. Do you know of anything like that? So, so you're on a shared hosting setup with multiple sites. Some are HTTPS and some are HTTP. Is that right? And so then the question is, um, do you have problems with memcache caching things you don't necessarily want? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure which things you wouldn't want cached. Uh, but memcache is going to be uh, agnostic to whether the site is over SSL or not. Uh, and, and in fact, I think probably what's happening is, uh, I'm guessing if the load balancer SSL terminates there, and all requests actually go through to Drupal is probably either all HTTPS or HTTP. Uh, and it just happens to know that it's behind a proxy, so it generates uh, everything accordingly. Um, you know, that. Probably it, it, it's passing on an SSL header to make the request, right? Is that so um, in that case, um, Memcache is not going to be um, aware of how the request was made. Uh, what what gets cached in Memcache is, is likely going to be just you know just, just like it just like it was over regular HTTP. Yeah. Um, you, you could probably like in Drupal eight, you can control a lot of that with cache tags and things like that. Um, in Drupal six and seven, you're going to have to manipulate the the, the cache bins. You probably create a, a custom bin and, and kind of pick and choose and cherry pick what goes in there um, based on sensitivity of, of content, but yeah, that's that's, uh, that's going to be sort of um, irrespective of, of how the request was actually made. Sir? Um, as best I can ask, so there's a lot of discussion about having a tool for that. The approach taken is for the REST API and deliver full type content at disk, right? Mm -hmm. And that all makes sense to me if, if you're receiving that uh, in the client from the browser and you're treating it as a JavaScript and you're rendering it some way. Right. A lot of the tools we're talking about are storage tools and such that can involve um, you know, either attacking the server side at the edge to try to see what they got there. Mm -hmm. What are those things programmatically? What are they? It seems like they're sort of a standard environment for assembling an HTML, assembling markup, assembling an HTML, not receiving content in some other form. So you're asking about um, how headless people and how some of these other page assembly uh, techniques interact? I'm, I'm just sort of. I'm, Okay, so the question is, so so headless Drupal is designed to, to deliver its primary access content as something other than this HTML document that might be manipulated on the edge through edge side includes or, or something else. So, yeah, a, a very good question. So, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's going to be a slightly different technique. So, what you what you may actually have is, in this case, uh, Drupal is definitely not the website. You may have um, the thing that you, you kind of conceptually think of as the origin of your website is not actually Drupal at all, but it might be something like Node.js, which is using, I don't know, like Jade to generate templates. You know, so the actual markup begins here and, and not over here in Drupal. So you have something like a Node.js service uh, where you're actually managing your primary content. Um, and you may be using Drupal for things like user authentication um, and for other ancillary content. Um, 
or you may have um, a massive selection of services and Drupal is just handling, handling things like statistics or you know other like any really good examples off, off the top of my head, but um, so so this other thing over here might actually be the the origin of your HTML document that's delivered to users, and then it makes a lot of requests to this headless Drupal over here, um, and it says, hey, I want um, I want a JSON export of all of your uh, of all the content you have related to this particular uh, this particular taxonomy term, and so then that gets generated. Uh, via JavaScript and maybe pulls you know some of that stuff over through Ajax or whatever, uh, and and builds that on the edge in, into the page. So uh, yeah, so so definitely um, definitely in that case, Drupal is, is not going to be the origin of the HTML box, but uh, it might actually be the origin of all your fragments that get included into something else that's building your your HTML box. Does that help? Yeah, so so in, in your content management system in Drupal, you've got a lot of marked up content already, like the body of a node, for instance, may be really marked up already. It's going to have a lot of HTML, but by itself, that body is really just a fragment of, of an HTML page. Um, so in, in that case, you, you may you may use Drupal as a way. You may use the the, the Drupal 8 WYSIWYG to mark up the body content, and then you may use uh, headless Drupal um, to transport that and a bunch of disparate fields via JSON to some other service where that gets assembled either client side um, through big pipe or or maybe maybe it has individual fragments of, of that article that you're interested in, in displaying um, as DSI fragments that get built on the edge. Um, but I, I think for your interest in AI are probably going to be a little bit more client side assembly rather than edge side assembly. Um, uh, JavaScript would let you be able to kind of pick and choose with a little bit more granularity, uh, customized to a particular user, because you could you could actually go to headless Drupal, get a request of all that user's preferences in JSON, um, and that's sort of the, the page level bootstrap. Um, so you're actually you know you may be looking at something like a like a single page application uh, where that page is is loading pieces of the page based on user activity. You click on something and it doesn't actually reload the page, it actually just rebuilds the page based on some, some markup that it requests from your Drupal instance. 